Sanford Anderson. You know, I fervently believe that by whatever name you call him, or some people might say her, God Almighty is the ultimate creative force in all the universe. As his creations, we must ourselves be creative. I believe that all of us are artists. But some people are blessed to be aware that he or she is an artist. And I have the great fortune of speaking with someone now who has enjoyed that blessing for a good portion of his life, Mr. Richard Press. Thank you. How you doing, brother? Doing great. How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. good. And we share the same birthday. Same birthday, birthday same yeah. year. Yeah, how about the same year? Yeah. You're not as old as I am. Uh, 1950. You did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> said it very low. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, they picked it up, but that's cool. I, I'm proud of my age. Man, we have a lot in common. Yeah, there. we sure do. Yeah. Same school. Uh, North North school. State. Yeah, I went to North State for a semester. They said, you got to go. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so let's talk about the art. Yes. When did you realize that you were an artist? Well, I can tell you when I realized that I had an interest in art. Okay. Um, right. It was early on, probably about the seventh grade. Uh, my brother, my oldest brother, Pearly, was, was an artist. Okay. And um, I had no interest in it until one day I saw him sitting down getting ready to draw or paint a picture. So I stopped, uh, asked myself, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to paint this horse. So I looked at the horse. I looked at his palette, which is his colors. Right. I said, well, the horse is brown. He says, I know. I said, well, how are you going to make it brown? There's not brown on, in the colors. So you stand here and watch. So I did. Everybody else went out to play. I stood and watched him. Right. And lo and behold, he took a picture about this small, and he made a picture about this large of a brown horse. <laughs> I could never figure out how he got brown out of those colors, out of the red, blue, and yellows. So that's kind of sparked my interest. But, you know, sometimes it just takes a, a small seed to spark an interest for a lifetime. And I think that's what happened to me. So you were interested then because of your curiosity? Curiosity is, yeah. is what got me. Okay. And then, you know, um, from curiosity, you start experimenting. Because, you know, well, curiosity never dies. Right, unless right. you find some way to <laughs> find out what they carry, uh, the, uh, the end result of that curiosity. Sure. And so, um, you know, the main thing I wanted to do then was draw. It wasn't into painting, it was into drawing. Uh, okay. Because I couldn't afford paints. Paints cost money. How about it? <laughs> So uh, the only way I could get paints was at school, and then we had to do what the teachers so told us to do. You, you know? could experiment and explore. Exactly. There wasn't yeah. too much room for creativity. Right. Uh, so, uh, really? Not in, in an art class, that didn't allow a lot of creativity. That's right. We, we took art classes in a basement. Um, we had one teacher for the whole school, and um, they set out the rules for your art, and you followed those rules. You got graded on them. So if you wanted to be creative, you had to be creative at home. Or sure. in your recess. Right, right. And uh, that's what I found myself doing mostly. Okay, so you're speaking of public school now. Public school. Okay, and then right. you're from the Eastern Shore. From the Eastern Shore, uh, Cheriton. Uh, okay. Some people might uh, know where Cape Charles is, but Cheriton is adjacent to Cape Charles. Okay. Very, very small town. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was everybody's cousin. <laughs> you know, that's why I had to go to Georgia to find a wife. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, ironically, there are a lot of artists that come from the Eastern Shore. From I'm Cape not Charles. at all surprised. Yes, because, because they're, they're kind of close to. They're close, and the, we are, we lived on a peninsula. So when we say Eastern Shore, a lot of people relate that to Maryland, because right. when you're driving the Eastern Shore, you just keep going. You never think about what what towns am I passing? Right, right. You know? But you're right. passing a lot of towns that have a lot of history and a historic quality to them. And uh, so be before you know it, you're up in Salisbury. And you blinked an eye and you, you were past the peninsula. So a peninsula is whenever you have three sides of water. Sure, sure. Right? So as soon as you get across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, boom, that's my hometown. So how did that environment, was there anything in your environment, uh, in addition to what happened with your brother Pearly, uh, was there anything in your environment that, that, that gave you uh, creative ideas, uh, things that you wanted to? Uh, quite, quite a bit, because uh, the Eastern Shore, where I'm from is an agricultural area. Right. So right. we grew up working in the fields, you know. Um, even before uh, you entered high school, you were working. You were either picking p tomatoes, digging potatoes, right. cucumbers, the whole nine yards. So just those scenes, because the women used to dress up in um, pants, and they would generally have uh, two or three skirts over top of the pants. Okay. They would wear socks. Right. And uh, sometimes, you know, two or three pants socks. 
and um, they would wear these long uh, wide hats to keep the sun off of them because when we picked tomatoes there was no shade. Uh, okay. You work in 90 degree temperatures, uh, you get off in the evening, you have a half an hour lunch break, uh, you go eat your tuna fish sandwich <laughs> and uh, you on the bus and then you go back or either under the shade and you go back to work. So there were a lot of images that uh, that kind of inspired you, the, the ladies in the hat and the, the landscape and so forth. And I want to uh, talk about the, uh, the kind of art that you do and the, the mediums uh, that, uh, that you worked in. Um, but after that curiosity, was there a moment that, um, that you realized that, yeah, I'm an artist, this is who I am? Well, when I first realized it was when I got a scholarship uh, from... Well, that'll help. <laughs> yes, it helped. Uh, I got a scholarship. Um, uh, I went to Northampton County High School. And on the night of graduation, when they called the scholarships out, yeah, I, was, I was fortunate that my name was called out. My scholarship was for $10. Oh, wow. And uh, um, one interested lady gave me that scholarship. After I left the Eastern Shore, uh, I decided that I was going to go back and get that $10. But it cost me more money to go back to get it. <laughs> but it was the principle of it. It was the idea uh, that th this lady, you know, spent $10 to help boost my career in art. But um, when I first started doing art, I didn't, I didn't really capture the images that I saw on the Eastern Shore. For some reason, they were, they were kind of uh, harmful. They, they kind of hurt you. Okay. Because my mother was doing the same thing. I remember the image of her nail coming down a dirt road, coming home, and um, with that long, wide head on. Right. And uh, we just looked at it and said, that's our mother who's out there working for us, you know, on this particular day. So I didn't want to recreate that image. I understand. Um, uh, but after I had studied a little bit about John Biggers, John yes. Biggers was right. an artist that went right. to Hampton University. Right. He became one of my uh, idols in art. Uh, okay. he, he painted a lot about his life uh, growing up. He never painted women's hands to be beautiful. He always painted the hands larger than life, and he always painted them soiled. And I used to wonder why he did that, and I had an opportunity to, to meet him. And he said that because women's hands weren't beautiful back then. Black women's hands were not beautiful. They worked the fields. They washed the clothes, they cooked the food. When the men had to go off into the military, they took care of everything. They took care of the bills. Why should he paint their hands beautiful when that's not a, that's not a correct statement? So you began to appreciate that you were to use art to tell the truth. To tell the truth. Okay. And, and I, think it's, I think it's incumbent um, amongst artists, visual artists especially, right. to tell the story. Uh, in the old days, especially in the biblical days, artists back in those days would tell a story through their artwork. Well, we're going to uh, uh, take a break now, sure. and we're going to take a look at some of your work, okay? okay? And uh, our viewers will get an opportunity to see it. Great. Okay, and you Great. can tell us those stories. Thank you. All right. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. We're talking to artist Richard Press. And right now, you're going to get an opportunity to see a sample of some of Richard's work. Okay, so we have several pieces here that we're going to take a look at, and uh, the viewers are going to see them along with us. What is this first piece, and, and what is it called? Well, this first one is called uh, The African Wedding. Okay. Uh, it's uh, a person from the Hembe tribe. Okay, this is a real person. This is a real person. Okay. And... Um, uh, this is the uh, garments that they wear during their wedding, um, somewhat of the garments that they wear. Uh, they normally dress in very little to nothing in this particular tribe, but when they have a, um, a ceremony or a wedding or such, then this is what would be considered, I guess, um, that would be compared to a tuxedo in our society. Okay. And uh, these colors in here, these hues in here, um, you see a lot of brown, but as I right. said before, based on what my brother was doing, I don't use brown, I mix it. So. Uh, the browns in here are rich and, um, and, and heavy that uh, come out to a, a nice tone when, when you merge them out. And, and a bunch of different tones of the brown. So you, you're creating the, the color that you You create to, the colors. Yeah. Uh, you, it's, it's a mixture of colors that you can use and then you can make them darker by adding black to them or you can right. give a tint to them by making them a little bit um, uh, more white. Right. 
Now, see, I remember a little bit from that. Outside, I see, I see that. State. I can understand okay. that. All right, let's take a look at the second one. Okay. The next one is... Um, Man, that's so uh, powerful. Uh, this is a child, and the, the reason I have this one is because of the expression. Uh, the eyes are uh, sort of captivating, and they Indeed. sort of go right into the soul of the viewer. Uh, uh, but the, the major thing here is the, um, the ceremonial painting that they use on their faces. Everything comes from the earth, um, one way or the other. Uh, all the hues, and some of them are placed in particular places based on certain symbols uh, that they have. But this particular piece is a part of another painting, which is um, uh, this well, one That's right the next one here. That's okay. the next one. Uh, these are called the Emo uh, River. Valley okay, both, both of those pieces. Both okay. of them. They just look different because this was taken at a different angle. Right. And I actually use this as a separate piece, uh, even though it's cropped from here. Okay, so this piece here with the, the head dress on and so forth. Right. And this, this kind of gives you an idea of the different things they use from the trees. Um, they don't have Maybelline over there, so they have to uh, use what they uh, can get from the earth. And they do a fantastic job of it. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's a great mixture of color here. Uh, they use a shell from different animals or crawling creatures. And, um, so that, that headwear is actually a shell? That's actually a shell. Oh, wow. Right, right. Wow. Everything that they have is you know, it's from the earth or from the water. Um, and the reason I, I, I chose these Africans is because I'm doing a series of works called Into Africa. Uh, it, it's about people that are still in living right. in Africa. So it's into Africa as opposed to out of, out of Africa. <laughs> okay, if it was out of Africa, maybe they would be here in the United States. Right, right. But they're still there, so I'm going into Africa and I'm trying to capture some of the things that they do in their rituals and ceremonies. We were talking earlier about the, the uh, th this piece, uh, as all your work, has a lot of texture in it. Uh, and, and when you are pursuing uh, you know, getting that texture that you want, is there uh, some kind of feeling that, that is generated within that, uh, that is manifested in your, in your mixing, creating the texture? The feeling is there. Well, first, you know, if you have the idea, that's, that's great. But it's, it's, it's nothing like having an inspiration and a feeling when you're painting because the canvas is empty. And the canvas is, is empty to me as well as it is to you. We can both get two different inspirations from it. I use uh, music. If I'm painting uh, African scenes, then I'll use African music. Right. And uh, sometimes I'll play African stories, which are very heartening. If you look at some of the conditions that uh, the people sure. live in Africa. Right. So when, when I paint something like this, a ceremonial, it's a happy time. Right. It's a time for that the, they're happy, but it's not always like this. It's not a rosy picture. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's uh, kind of an austere happiness. It's, you know, um, that's almost like an oxymoron. But you know, the the eyes say so much in this particular piece. Let's let's take a look at the next right. one. Here. Yeah, I do put a lot of emphasis on the eyes, as oh, you can well, see in this perfect. painting. <laughs> uh, this painting right here is a is a picture of a lady who uh, you cannot see the whole picture because I haven't shown that to everyone yet. Right. But in this painting here, the lady was a large turbine that they make, uh, they put on the ground and they take the cloth and they make it. It's, it's so large that it go, hover, hovers over the back. And um, uh, the purpose is to cover the, to the child that they carry. They carry the child on their back and so um, this protects them against the sun. But I made the eyes in here green because my father's eyes were green. Right. And occasionally when I'm painting people, I will do that as a, it's a, it's a memo to me. Right, right. That, uh, I give him homage. Uh, Making it a more personal experience. More personal experience. True. And what is this uh, next piece we have? The next piece is a piece I call The Dancer. Um, okay. It is a, um, it's a painting of a sculpture that was done by Edgar Degas. Edgar Degas was a painter uh, who um, most of his life painted ballerinas. He painted them as if though they right. were practicing, right, uh, right, never right. noticing the painter involved. Right. Well, he tried his hand at a sculpture and uh, even though he was very well uh, liked and revered in his community as an artist, when he showed that sculpture, he was um, almost an outcast. Uh, he was almost blackballed by the art community because this was the mid-1800s. And when he showed her looking like an African-American, the people of that day said, no, African-American girls do not delve into this type of fine arts. They're, they're not delicate. They're not delicate yeah. enough and they're not intelligent enough to be ballerinas. So in this painting here, I painted her and changed her color. Now in the original painting of this, I have a mask on her face. 
it just so happens that uh, someone requested that I put some, uh, face, uh, some facial features on it. But in the original, there's a mask. And the idea is to say, if she had a mask on, and if she was this color, would you have been banned? Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Uh, this is another great piece. Uh, and what is this piece here? This is another person from the Emo River Valley. Uh, it's a child. And uh, I put a lot of emphasis on the eyes. Right. Because I want this person's eyes to look right through the soul of the viewer. The first thing I, I um, think you managed to do that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, the first thing that's captivating about this picture that I would hope the viewers would get would be the different color colorations in the picture. And if you, you talked about texture, I tried to make it so that the texture around here looked like that it was real texture, and the eyes, which is the most captivating part of it. Okay, uh, when we, uh, we're going to take a break now, and when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the texture and the, how the eyes are themselves a part of the, the whole texture uh, experience. Sure. All right, so we'll talk further on the other side of the break. Okay. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, Richard, uh, tell us more about this piece. Uh, what, is it, what is the name of it, by the way? This is uh, Emo, Emo River Valley 2. Okay. Because okay. they're from the same tribe. Right, right. Uh, this piece right here, I wanted to make it uh, look like it had texture. Now, sometimes if you don't put your brush down hard and just let it roll over the canvas or the paper, uh, you can get some dimension in your paints. So that makes it look like it has texture. And in this painting, you can see that down at, around the mouth, you can see variations, uh, shades or tints of, of white, which gives the illusion of texture. Uh, texture is, a, is an element of art. And, and when you put it in your work, you have to be uh, very careful about how it's balanced out with the rest of the picture. But, you, you know, that, that leads me to the, to the next question. Here. And I, I want to thank you so very much for bringing, sure. bringing your work yeah. for, to share with our viewers. Um, I am of the impression that uh, that human beings, uh, by our very nature, there's a lot of symmetry, you know, left side and right side and so forth. Uh, but that doesn't always hold true when you when you're working with someone's face, you know. I mean, because sometimes the one eye might be smaller than the other, you know. And so there's some some disparity. How do you manage to capture those kind of subtleties? I guess it's just capturing what you see. Well, actually, you know, knowing the proportions of the face. Right. For example, when, when you look at one's face, you would think that the eyes are not halfway across the face, but if actually the eyes are halfway from the top of your head to the bottom of your chin. Okay. Uh, it's kind of hard to visualize that when you, when you don't know what the proportions are. Um, so once you know the proportions, it's easier for you to know where things are placed. However, perfection is not always the goal. Uh, we have a, a type of art called cubism, where perfection is not the goal. Picasso. Picasso, I, I, I have a, a line of uh, work that I've done in, cube, in cubism. Um, sometimes when, when things are too perfect, the viewer looks for errors. We don't want the viewer to look for errors. We want the viewer to admire the work and to become a part of the work. So when things are too realistic, it becomes uh, uh, open for too much criticism. Uh, that's why a lot of times you'll see people, that the, the impressionists, who are not fixed on trying to make a tree look like a tree, but just to give you the impression of a tree or the impression of a flower. Therefore, you, have, you eliminate so much of the criticism of the work, and the, the, uh, the viewers actually uh, happen to enjoy the composition as opposed to trying to find out the little nitpicky things that are wrong with it. And uh, impressionism actually opens the artist up to be more free and to put the light where it's supposed to be and the shadows right. where it's supposed to be. You know, to the artist, I think that there's likely something inherently beautiful about imperfection. Right? Is, is that Most is that definitely. Yeah. And you'll find that a lot of uh, African-American artists uh, get the question as to why they paint faces black. And uh, some people say, well, you don't know how to do uh, uh, facial uh, proportions or, or facial features. That is not the case. The reason why a lot of black artists paint faces black is because they don't want the fixation to be on the expression of the person. 
when you see a face, you're trying to think whether or not the person is beautiful, or you can say the person is ugly, that person doesn't look right, the nose is messed up, instead of concentrating on what the story of the painting is. So if the face is not there, but just the, uh, the black color that's there, then you have, your, you have the whole world that's open to you for your interpretation on that instead of being critical of the facial uh, uh, features. So a, a visual artist uh, uh, is a storyteller. He's a storyteller. And we've always been storytellers. And one of, the, one of my goals right now is to get more artists in the Tywood area, right. in this area, to tell the story of what's going on now. All down through the years, you have musicians, um, you have storytellers, you have poets who talk about the happenings, what is going on today. Right. What are we going to look at years from there and, and, and look at this and say, this is what happened at that particular time period. Well, artists have, visual artists have the same responsibility. I mean, it's, it's great to be able to paint a duck in the water. That's fantastic. But you, know, you can paint a duck in the water 20 years from now. If you miss what's going on and you don't tell the story in your art right now, you're missing the boat. I'm curious. Um, you know, we talked earlier uh, about your, your working in oil. Do you always work in oil? Or? No, I don't always work in oil. If I'm doing a large mural for a church, which uh -huh. I do, or funeral homes or whatever, a lot of times I work in oil. But uh, if you work in oil too much, you could become sick because of the, uh, the smell from it. Right. So uh, I will work on acrylic, and then I will work in an oil. But I might do one oil painting for every three acrylics. Okay. Uh, I've had that problem before of getting uh, a fixation after painting a mural in my garage where there's no ventilation, and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll wear on you. And acrylic paint dries much quicker, too. Acrylics dry much quicker. Okay. Uh, they're, they're easy to mix. But they don't give you the same blend um, um, as oil paints, right? Because oil paints tend to cousin with each other; it becomes a family with the color when you're mixing it. Right. Acrylics can do that, but you have a short, much shorter time to right, do it. Right, right, right. If you were to paint Richard, uh, you know everything that you do is a masterpiece. But is there well, something, you know, uh, uh, something that you really want to work on? Is there something that you that you, that's ruminating in your spirit, a, a piece that you like to do? Well, there's one piece. Um, I wanted to paint a vision of uh, my mother uh, as I saw her when she came off the bus, the work bus. And we were all at the, uh, at the end of the road because we accompanied the house that she didn't know about. They were from Philadelphia. And we knew that she did not want them to see her like that. So we were outside the house and we were trying to wait until she got into close enough range to say, you have company, you have company. Right, and we right. just saw her dragging down the road with those dresses on and those pants and that hat tilted to the side. And I always wanted to capture that, that image. And so my passed at 94 years old um, two years ago, last year, actually. Wow, I'm so sorry yeah, to hear that, brother. Uh, so you're working up preparing yourself to, to tackle that piece. Right. And that, really well, it's a special piece, and, sure. you, and you have to be prepared for it. That's, that's a piece that you probably want to uh, be more uh, in tune with than the viewers, because that's, that's a personal piece. That's understood. But I would imagine that there are a lot of people that can identify with it, especially people that uh, from agricultural um, uh, places sure. like where I came from. And we are going to be running out of time uh, in just a, a moment here, but uh, how would you define yourself as an artist? If you could use one word to define yourself as an artist, what word might that Inspirator. be? Inspirator. Okay. Inspirator. Okay. Because I spend more time with kids. I volunteer right. uh, twice a week uh, teaching right. kids. And I find out that uh, when you inspire kids, you inspire yourself. Right. And when you see the look on their faces and when they start jumping on your back and swinging on your arm and then <laughs> you're so glad to go home, but you're so glad that you did what you did. And I've seen so many successes of kids that I've taught who have pursued art as they come up. So inspiration is the biggest thing at my age. Well, sir, you are a piece of art yourself. You are your own masterpiece, and one that we really, truly appreciate. I want to thank you so very much for coming on and uh, joining us today on Biorhythms. Well, thank you, Terrence. It was great being here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fellow Sagittarius. <laughs> fellow Sagittarius. And fellow artists. I just do a little bit kind of <laughs> Again, thank you so very much. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us, and please stay tuned for the next edition of Biorhythms. I tell all of you, Goodbye. Goodbye. Take care.